The Color Chart Warfare Conference is the only conference in the state of Wisconsin that convenes to focus solely on the needs of black children, youth, and their families who are involved in the foster care system. On May 8, 2017, almost 400 community stakeholders and 67 local organizations came together at the Milwaukee Art Museum for food, fun, laughter, and training by a number of industry experts in the interest of preserving and supporting black families. We certainly hope to see you at next year's conference. Enjoy the video. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise as the glistening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory has won. Stony the road we tried, bitter the chastity ride, felt in the days when hope unborn has died, yet steady we beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Have, have come over away with the tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past, here now we stand at last. Where a white gleam of our bright star has cast. God of the weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou hast brought us thus far on the way. Thou who hast by thy might led us until the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places of God where we meet thee. Least our heart drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand. True to our God, true to our native land. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> our conference today is themed, Giving Our Children Roots and Wings. We're talking about the 67% the 67% of black children that we find today that are engaged in the child welfare system in Wisconsin. Today will be filled with a lot of information, excellent presenters, many vendors that will share a variety of resources to assist you with the work that you are doing to impact the lives of the 67%. And you will also have many opportunities to learn from each other. You will have opportunities to interact with social work practitioners, clinicians, researchers, educators, policymakers, 
judges, advocates, and parents. Please review your program for information as we want you to get the most out of this day. And when this day is over, know that the work continues. And in order for us to impact the lives of black children in this community, we need uh, each and every one of you. I have the distinct pleasure this morning to introduce a young woman that I never knew I would meet in person. I saw her on television. She was an internet, uh, internet sensation. Her name is Princess Peyton Rain Kim Jackson. She is a brilliant five-year-old spoken artist an internet sensation. She has been reading since she was 18 months old. She is now able to fluently read fifth grade sight words according to her latest school test scores. Peyton is reading better than 99.9% .9 of other children her age in the nation. It can be done. Peyton has been performing on television since the age of three. Her first television appearance was on the Windy City live show in Chicago, where she performed a poem called, Hey Black Child. Her next big performances were on NBC's Little Big Shots, y'all know with Steve Harvey. In addition to having fans from Africa, Europe, Australia, and Mexico, a few of her famous, famous fans are, are Ty Diggs, Sean P. Diddy Combs, Ayanna Van Zant, and Malaya Obama. We are pleased to have Peyton recite first for us, Hey Black Child, then a poem written by her parents entitled Affirmations. Her parents truly understand the importance of giving Peyton roots and wings. Milwaukee, let's welcome Peyton to the color of child welfare. Hey, black child, by you, Sandy Perkins. Hey, black child, do you know who you are? Who you really are? Do you know you can be what you want to be if you try to be? what you can be. Hey, black child, do you know where you are going? Where you're really going? Do you know you can learn what you want to learn? If you try to learn what you can learn. Hey, black child, do you know you are strong? I mean, really strong. Do you know you can do what you want to do? If you try to do what you can do. Hey, black child, be what you can be. Learn what you must learn. Do what you can do. And tomorrow, your nation will be what you want it to be. And now I will perform affirmations. Every morning up early and bright, I look in the mirror and I recite affirmations by mom and dad. I am beauty. I am brave. I am intelligent. I am smart. I am health. I am wealth. I am treasure. I am heart. I am talent. I'm ambition. I'm success. I am daring. I am capable. I am helping. I am sharing. I am caring. I am water. I am earth. I am air. I am light. I am peace. I am love, I am future, I am bright, I am girl, I am princess, I am woman, I am queen, I am strong, I am 
divine. I express God. I am me. Thank you so much, Peyton, for joining us today. You certainly helped to start this Color of Child Welfare Conference off with a bang. And I don't think anyone in this room will ever forget Peyton. Thank you so much. So as I indicated earlier, we have a full program on this morning and we have a number of people that will be speaking um, briefly this morning. And um, I'm going to call them uh, in the order that they will be coming this morning. First, we have Dr. Robin Joseph, Chief Administrator of the Division of Milwaukee Child Protective Services to come and give greetings. Following her, we have uh, the mayor of the city of Milwaukee, Tom Barrett, who will come and bring greetings. After uh, the mayor, we have the Honorable Mary Trigiano, Deputy Chief Judge and Presiding Judge of Bell Phillips Juvenile Justice Center. Following Judge Trigiano, we will have Fred Royal, the president of the NAACP, if you would come in that order. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Robin Joseph, and I am the new administrator of the new division of Milwaukee Child Protective Services, and I am very, very pleased to share the morning with you, and I want to thank the organizers of the event for inviting me, and um, I want to thank this very beautiful and talented young lady for inspiring me with her words, as I think she inspired everybody. Yeah. And also, I want to thank her parents because she couldn't be who she is without them. So I appreciate them. I am here to represent the interest and to talk to you a little bit and welcome you this morning because I represent the interest of children in Milwaukee County in need of protection from abuse and neglect. And so I would like for them too, as she stated, to have roots and wings. And I believe that this is a place where all of that happens and where all of that starts. And so I welcome you on behalf of the children who are needing more. They're needing parents like she has, and they're needing to be affirmed each morning. And I thank you all for welcoming me, me here. And welcome to you. Good morning. I'm Mayor Tom Barrett, and I am uh, honored and pleased to be here this morning. If you look right over my shoulder, you'll see one of the most beautiful views of our city. You'll see that water sparkling. And I think anybody who's in this room and is looking at that has to appreciate, particularly on a morning like this, just how gorgeous this lake is and how blessed we are to live in a city with resources like the resources we have right behind us. But as I walked in this morning, I thought about the lake and I thought about this conference. And I thought about my wife, who's a teacher and has been a teacher for about 20 years. And early on when we were dating, uh, she was teaching over at Clara Barton School, which is on 58th and Green Tree. And I remember her talking about a field trip, uh, bringing some of her kids here to the lakefront. And she remarked to me at the time that it was a wonderful trip, but she was surprised that a good number of her kids had never been to the lakefront. And sadly, 20 years later, that in many ways reflects the state of our city still. Um, we have this glorious, glorious heart of the city here in downtown, and I'm proud to be the cheerleader and the promoter of all the great things that are going on in the heart of the city. At the same time, I cannot forget words that my mother spoke to me when I was growing up, that a mother is only as happy as her unhappiest child. And if you're a mother or a dad, you know exactly what my mother was saying. And in many ways, being mayor is like that. Because as proud as I am of the great successes we are having here in the heart of the city, I am mindful and can never forget the challenges we see for so many children and people of color in this city right now. We see a huge disparity, not just in the city, but in the region and the state, between African Americans and others. And we know what our challenges are. And this is about 
well-being of children, and it really starts at the very beginning. It starts many times before a child is born. And I give a lot of credit to Wanda Montgomery and the work that she's doing with us as we try to tackle the, the challenges of infant mortality. Every one of us wants to see a child blow out the candle on their first birthday cake. And we've worked hard in this community to reduce the infant mortality. And we've had successes. But one area where we haven't had success, or at least the success that we need to have, is reducing the infant mortality rate for African-American babies. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, this is just a greeting, but I just want to point out, when we started this out, we thought we would focus on what I would call the low-hanging fruit, which is the co-sleeping deaths. Um, but it didn't take us long to realize that even though those were the deaths that received most attention in the media, they comprised probably in the neighborhood of 20% of the deaths of young babies. Another 20% or so would be complications due to genetic defects, but the majority, probably 60% of our premature or infant deaths result, come as a result of complications due to prematurity. So what is it that is driving this factor for young African American mothers? And as we've analyzed it, we come back over and over and over again to many of the life stresses that young women in this community and young men in this community of color face. And so as we focus on these issues, we have to recognize that of course, of course, of course, it's important to have that access to a physician or to a nurse. It's important to have the right diet, but we have to look at the entire life experience. And I think that's what we're gonna have today. We're gonna have a, a chance to look at that entire life experience. And we all know that from time to time, we're gonna have people who beat the odds. Everybody loves to see someone beat the odds. Our challenge is actually to change the odds so that young, young children of color will have a better chance. Peyton is fabulous and we love listening to her. I want 100 Peytons. No one's ever gonna match Peyton, but I want 100 Peytons coming out of this community because that's what we have to do. But I think by coming together, working together, we're going to make progress. So I wanna thank you for being here today. Thank you for believing in our children, which means that you believe in our future. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Peyton, I don't know you very well, but I'm very proud of you, and I think you could be a judge someday. I became a lawyer almost 30 years ago. I worked at Legal Action of Wisconsin for almost 10 of those years, helping folks who lived in poverty, were isolated, unemployed, and oftentimes homeless. I've been a judge for over a dozen years now, and I have spent the majority of those years at Children's Court here in Milwaukee working with families in the child welfare system. Over the years, I have seen firsthand the powerful, powerful voices in the community come together, determined to address such issues as drug addiction, violence, mental illness, domestic violence, trauma, and human trafficking. I also have witnessed a recent, more pronounced focus on finding solutions to address the color of the juvenile and criminal justice systems as well as the disparate impact of child welfare on families of color here in our community. And it has not just been a call for a polite discussion, it is discussing those things that make us uncomfortable. It is about challenging ourselves individually, about our own unconscious racial biases, and collectively designing systems and processes to overcome that very human part of us all. Systems that are grounded in evidence, public health, and prevention, and that signal hope that as a society, we can reduce racial disparities while keeping at-risk children safer. And that is what we are all about. The research about racial disparities in our systems is very unsettling at times. There's a quote in a Marquette Law Review article on racial bias in the foster care system, and it goes something like this. Racial disparities perpetuate stereotypes, fragment families, depopulate communities, and impede racial healing. 
We are all losers when disparities remain entrenched. After today, after hearing some of these remarkable speakers and a beautiful quotes and statements by Peyton here, we will all have work to do. Hard and challenging work. And what we do next is what matters most and will define who we are as a community. Thank you. Good morning. Fred Royal, President of NAACP Milwaukee Branch. I won't be before you long. Um, 1965, Patrick Moynihan wrote a paper talking about the case for national action to assist the Negro family. Now, even more than then, this challenge is true today because of the policies on drugs, the policies on drug enforcement, the policies that keep families disenfranchised and, di and, and fragmented. We are in the state of condition in this city that 60% of our children are in uh, some type of foster system. That's unacceptable. It should be unacceptable to all of us. I give you all credit for doing what you do on a daily basis to try and make a difference. I want to thank Wanda Montgomery and Jermaine Reed for putting this together. As we see in this young star Peyton, it's easier to raise healthy children than to repair broken adults. Thank you. Thank you to each one of our speakers on this morning. And um, just want to remind you that there is free Wi-Fi here, MAM 2017. Please place your cell phones on mute or vibrate. No video, phone, or audio recording. You know we do all that FaceTime Live and um, please support the learning experience throughout the day by reducing the amount of traffic in and out of workshops. Um, seats and workshops are reserved for people who were pre-registered. Some of the workshops are at or over capacity. So just remember that. And if you need a break, if you want to walk down by the lake at some point today, just walk and Stand alone. We don't want anybody falling over. So we want to make sure that you are safe today. Um, at this time, I'm going to call um, Dr. I'm going to call uh, Jermaine Reed. Uh, what is it? No, Bertha Jean, baby boy, to the microphone. Good morning, everybody. How's the family doing? Isn't it just a beautiful day in a beautiful place? When they say a great place on a great lake, and there are so many people here, and we want to say thank you for um, coming to the Colored Child Welfare Conference. This is the third time we've done this conference, and we have over 60 organizations who are represented today. And we certainly want to say thank you all for believing in black children, black youth, and black families, and doing what you all can do to help improve outcomes. It certainly is a collective effort. I have the distinguished honor of introducing my brothers, my friends, to participate in the next segment of our program, which is the conversation with Dr. Ramel Smith, who will be our facilitator. Dr. Ramel Smith, you can come on up and take your position. We also have Sean Roby on the panel, and our very special guest from Los Angeles, Mr. Freeway, Ricky Ross. This is going to be a very important conversation where we're going to be talking about America's war on drugs, interview with Mr. Ross, a former drug kingpin on race, drugs, 
the government and the destruction of the black family. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm, I want to come up here just for the, for the start of this because uh, there's a lot of people giving me a lot of things to ask Brother Ross, a lot of things to say to him, both uh, good and bad. So in uh, preparation for this, I started to do a lot of homework on it. You know, I heard about the legend, the myth, the man. I wanted to know the real. And so for the last two weeks specifically, I've done in-depth to the point where my family has gotten sick of you, Mr. Ross. Because he's on my TV, he's on my, on my radio, we're, we're going over things. And, and when I got a chance to meet him for the first time, it was just this charismatic personality. But in being a psychologist, you know, I'm, I'm careful of that because sometimes people can have a charismatic personality, but it's not always sincere. But I'm gonna tell you what the true test for me was, was this. Yesterday, he got a chance to speak to some of our youth in our community. And because I've been talking about him so much in the household, I brought my son and my daughter. And they listened to him speak to a crowd, a very intimate crowd, about 55, 65 people, where they got a chance to really talk to him, to really listen to his story. Now, the two of my children that I brought were eight and were 12. Now, you know how eight-year-old is. He's squirming around. I'm not even thinking he's listening. But by the time he was done and it went for question and answer, he was the first one with his hand raised. And I didn't even think he was going to ask a real question, but he asked him a legitimate question. But I'm going to tell you what happened afterwards that really got me was this. All night, my two children talked about him. They talked about his story. They talked about his courage. They talked about the things that he was trying to do. He had said, and one mentioned that he had saw a movie called Superfly. Some of us saw that movie in here. And he said that's what gave him the vision of being a drug dealer, but getting in and getting out, trying to just see the glamorous side of it. But he said the same way I envisioned that, when I was in prison, I envisioned the things I was going to do when I got out. And he says, I've already done that. Now this man was born January 26, 1960, which means he's 57 years old. But if you listen to him talk with his goals, you think he was 17. So when, when, we, when we listen to him today, I want this to be the Rick Ross show. We want to give him the microphone to not only tell his story, but more importantly, to tell us some information, give us some tidbits that when we leave here, we have some nuggets from somebody who's been inside the system in an intimate way to help us, to help our babies. Y'all ready for Brother Ross? Now, oftentimes, when people talk to him, they say, well, he's done a 180-degree turn. And I said, no, that's not true. He's done a 360-degree turn. And they said, no, don't you mean 180? I said, no, 180 would mean that he started off bad and now doing good. I said, this man started off good, made some different turns, but now he's turning back around and marching in the right direction. So, Rick, the first question I want you to do is to tell the people about your family. And I'm not just talking about your mom and your dad, but your grandma, your granddad, your great mom, great grandma, back in Texas. Yeah, um, I was born in Tyler, Texas. Um, my uh, grandfather was a sharecropper. Uh, Jim Martin was his name. Uh, he died when I was around six or seven, but I did get to know him uh, uh, a little bit. And I know that he instilled the work ethic that I picked up uh, because my family had it and the time that I stayed with him, he was always working. And I also know that my mom picked cotton as a, as a little girl. She wasn't able to go to school uh, full time like she wanted to. So uh, half the season they would go during the uh, cotton picking season to San Antonio, El Paso, Texas, and they would be picking cotton. Uh, my mom and my father married um, shortly after that. Uh, my brother, I had an older brother, David, and I was born in 1960. Uh, my mother and my father split up four months after I was born. Uh, she stayed in Texas for about three years later, but she figured it would be 
better for us in California. So she moved to California in 1963. Um, <clears throat> me and her stayed on, uh, my, my brother didn't come with us. Uh, he stayed in Texas with my father until my mom got settled. Me and her slept on one of my auntie's couches for about two years until she was able to get a couple jobs, cleaning offices, houses. Uh, she also did gardening work. I remember when the watch ride broke out. Um, burn, baby, burn, the Black Panthers, I went through all that. Um, around 12 years old, I started playing tennis. Um, I'm pretty good at tennis. Up until high school, I played tennis, and, and that's what kept me out of the gangs. I remember when the Crips started in, in LA, uh, I can remember the first day, I was in the fifth grade, and they came to our elementary school, and it was about 200 guys, and they were standing all outside the school. The whole school was, was on alert. All the kids were looking out the windows. Um, the first time that I ever saw Tookie Williams. Um, after that day, I wanted to be a Crip. It was something that I admired about the togetherness, uh, the organization. After that, I had saw the Crips have several meetings in the park, and uh, we were too young to, to go and be a part of it, but we sit around the outer circle and watch them do what they do, you know, drink and play fight and, and so forth. I got lucky, though. When I started playing tennis, it took me out of the neighborhood. My younger brothers and sisters wasn't as lucky as I was. They didn't pick up tennis. They all turned into gangbangers. Um, I stayed out of South Central, basically. I slept there, but I didn't live there. I hung out with a totally different society, per se. Uh, most of the people that I hung out with owned their own houses. They drove nice cars. Um, sometimes they would bring me home in cars that all my friends' mouth would be hanging out. They'd bring me home in a Mercedes, a Rolls Royce. Uh, tennis gave me an exposure to a point in life that most of my family didn't see. Um, at 18 years old, though, when it was time for me to graduate from high school. Let me, let me stop you right there, because I want the people to, to understand this. He said at the age of 12, he really started doing tennis. Now, this man has written a wonderful autobiography. And uh, it was something that captured me, that you said you lost your innocence at the age of six. Now, we often talk about these adverse childhood experiences and things that go through, but I want you to see how resilient that this young man is and the things that he went through to even at the age of 12 to still be thinking for. Tell the people what happened on that fateful day when you were six. Well, we come home, me and my mom, and um, I don't know where we had been, but we come in the door, and when we come in the door, we could tell that my uncle was on one of his drunken rage. Um, most of my uncles died from alcoholism, uh, but this particular day my uncle was drunk and when we walked in the house, we could hear the commotion, but I didn't know what was going on until after my mom walked in the kitchen. Well, he was in the kitchen stabbing it, his wife. Uh, this was my mom's brother, uh, and his wife was her sister-in-law. And we had became kind of like a family. My uncle was, was like my father that I didn't have. I mean, he did stuff with me that my father had never did, and I love my uncle dearly. Um, well, he was stabbing his wife, and when my mom saw it, she just jumped in uh, immediately, grabbed his arm, started pushing him apart and trying to separate him. Well, my mom, she carried a pistol with her everywhere she went. Um, so she pushed him apart. Uh, my uncle stopped for a minute, and he allowed us to leave the house. My mom grabbed my auntie, wrapped her up, threw us all in a cab, and we took off. Uh, we went to my mom's boyfriend's house. Well, while we was at the house, my uncle came there. He kicked the door in. My mom pushed us all in the corner in the kitchen, me and my auntie, and she told me to just stand there. Um, she pulled her pistol out, and she told my uncle not to come any closer. And he kept coming with the knife, and she shot him one time. And uh, when they walked me by, I could hear him gasping for breath to, to try to breathe. Um, he later died from, from that gunshot wound. The cops came. They took my mom away. Um, and for a while, I had to live in a strange city without, without my mom uh, or my brother. Um, and it was dramatic on me for, for a while. I had nightmares. 
um, just, just traumatic, you know, to be that young in a city that you don't know anything about uh, without your mother. And I, what I was, I was living with my mom's boyfriend's mother for, for a couple months. I'm not sure how long it was, uh, but it definitely wasn't what I wanted. And a lot of times when I look back, I think that that could have been part of the reason that I didn't pick up on my reading at an early age. And so talk about that, because I know you were talking about when you, when you got 18, but talk a little bit about the troubles that you had in school, the, the lack of help that you had going through school, how you matriculated through that far without being able to read and write yet still graduate, and some of the violence that you still encountered in the high school years. Well, when I was going through school, what, what I had, had basically learned how to do in school to, to take up for my like of reading ability and uh, because I could, I could do my math. Math, I was good in math. But, <laughs> but my, my reading was my problem. Uh, is that I was just super nice to the teachers. You know, I didn't cause any problem in class. I would always sit in the back of the classroom. Uh, wouldn't participate, basically, in, in none of the, the things. And uh, by me being a, a good tennis player, when it was time for me to be eligible, my tennis coach would always come to my classrooms and talk to my teachers. and convinced them that it was better to give me a passing grade than to fail me. Uh, saying keeping me back in school wouldn't help nobody and the only thing that I had going on for myself was to be eligible to play on the tennis team and that they should allow me to continue to play on the team. And, and most of my teachers did it. So, so how did that decision that seemingly helped you come back to bite you in the butt? Well, when it was time for me to graduate, um, I started interviewing with different coaches and, and talking to people about going to college uh, because my friends who also was on the tennis team with me were all getting scholarships to, to universities and uh, my tennis ability was just as good as theirs. I played tennis just as good as they did, um, but my uh, education wasn't there. You know, I hadn't did my SATs, none of the things that, that go along with the school, uh, I hadn't did any of that stuff. Uh, so I found myself back in the South Central um, with nothing to do, not knowing where I was going. Um, and that's pretty much how I started selling drugs. Okay, so, so that, what other options were there for you at 18 where you said that was really plausible, something that you said I would legitimately do? Well, when, 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 when I was sitting in prison and, and I started writing my autobiography, uh, I'll try to take you back a little bit uh, to that. Day. I was in a, a what they call a MCC, Federal Detention Center, and these buildings are high rises. This building was 18 stories high. I was on the maximum security floor, meaning I was on the 18th floor uh, with bars all around me. And I was sitting there and I was trying to figure out how did I get in this place? What caused me to be in this situation? And as I thought back, I started to analyze my life. And also that's when I started writing my book. Well, what I found out is that from the time that my mom had left me up until then, I had never wanted to read. The people in my neighborhood who grew up around me, they taught me how to steal cars. They taught me how to pimp how to sell drugs, how to do a burglary, how to rob somebody at the ATM machine, all of these scenarios was all around me. I could learn any of them that I wanted. You know, I had a choice. You pick the one you want to do. I even remember the first time that I wanted to buy a house, nobody could tell me how to buy a house. I mean, I had cash money. I had all the money, but nobody in my neighborhood had ever bought a house, so nobody could tell me how to buy a house. Uh, I built my first motel when I was 22 years old. And I was running around the city asking everybody, how do you build a motel? How do you build a motel? Where do you go? Where do you start? What are the first steps? And I couldn't get those answers. So what I figured out is that in our community, crime is being taught readily. 
but learning how to do real estate, learning how to build a cell phone, these things are not in our communities. There's nobody over there. There's no doctors. The first lawyer I met, I was in court. The first judge I ever met, I was in the courtroom when I met the first judge, the first prosecutor. Uh, I was in court. The first police officer that I ever met was in an encounter. It wasn't a next door neighbor or somebody that you walk out the house and say, how you doing officer so and so, how's your day going? All of these people that I met for the first time was because of me committing crime. And I feel that our children need to be exposed to these people at an earliest age as possible. Because with that exposure gives them options. And without options or without hope, we turn to dope. And so talk on that. Tell, tell, let the people understand what made the dope game so glamorizing about the money that you made, about the people you thought you were helping as far as giving them employment, all of the things that make it sexy to the young people today. Well, what I did basically, how I became so successful in the drug business is, is I learned the drug business. I studied it. I analyzed the guys that I looked up to. And, and I, I guess I learned that from tennis. Because when I played tennis, I didn't have the money. You know, my, my, my friends who I played tennis with, some of their people had money to pay for lessons. So what I would do is I would go to their lesson and I would sit on the bench and I would watch the coach teach them. And I would learn from that. Uh, I remember the first time that I took my first tennis lesson, the coach told me, he said, man, you've been copying Larry so much that you do everything he do wrong. You do it too. What I had did is I had learned how to copy people, how to dictate, uh, I guess that's the word, what other people were doing. So when I went into the drug business, I took that same philosophy. But what I learned from my tennis coach is try not to do what they're doing wrong. So I did learn that from him. And, and one thing I'll tell you about me is that once I try anything, if somebody tell me something, I'm going to try to make a lie out of you to see if you're telling me the truth. And that's the way I've been doing my life, and, and, and that's how I became successful. So when I started studying the drug dealers, I studied what they did right, what they did wrong, and I would take from that to build my own identity. Once I became successful at selling drugs, then I started looking for guys who were in the same position that I was in, who. Maybe he played basketball and he hurt his knee, or maybe he didn't do good in school, but they had that, that, that drive, that determination to want to be successful. Well, I started looking for those type of people, or the women who, who, who boyfriend had left them with kids and they, they needed some extra money and wanted to be successful. So I looked for those people and then I started teaching them what I knew. And, and they started becoming just as successful as I was inside of that business, and that's how my drug business really flourished. So now talk about this, because you, you said you got good, so you started flourishing all the way to the top where you meet people like uh, Danilo Mladon and, and whatnot like that. So talk to the people a little bit about how America, the government, contributed to what's happened to you and what made it easier for you to get into the dope game. I started off with $125 in the drug business. Uh, around my second year, I had figured it out. So I went from that $125 in my second year, I probably was making about $10,000, $20,000 a day. It went from there to $100,000 a day. It went from $100,000 a day to $500,000 a day. It went from $500,000 a day to my last two years, right before uh, I had walked away, I was making a million dollars every single day. Some days I made $3 million. Well, when you become that successful in the drug business, you become attractive to people. There's people who are selling drugs who are looking for you. And you are looking for them. Well, one day one of my friends had pulled up. Uh, I was building this race car because I was going to be a, a professional race car driver. I, I was always... Uh, trying to figure a way out of the drug business like my man did, Superfly. See, he got out. That was my goal. I, my goal was to do what he did. I wanted to get out like he did. 
So I was building this race car that I was gonna be a pro stock racer and I was gonna be on the circuit and, and, and all my dreams was gonna come true that way. Because <laughs> the motel didn't work out. I, I built the motel but it didn't turn the money that I wanted. So I was building this race car and this guy came over and he said, man, I'm getting ready to lead a country but I'm gonna turn you over to the man. He told me that it was gonna cost me $60,000 for me to meet the man. I said, no problem. So I gave him the 60. They picked me up in the car, him and Danilo, told me everything that I wasn't gonna have to have all cash for my drugs no more. Uh, my drugs are gonna be more readily, plentiful, the price was going down. I mean, a match made in heaven. So, so tell the people with this connect, how much you were paying for a kilo of cocaine initially to when you got this cocaine and then how that helped your business problems when, even more. When I first started selling, uh, the first ounce I ever bought, I paid, I think, $3,300 for an ounce of cocaine. The first kilo I ever bought, I think I paid 45000 for it. Uh, the last kilo that I bought, I bought it for 9500 So we cut the price dramatically. Uh, so it said that sometimes you were serving over, buying over 100 kilos at a time. 100, 200 sometimes. I bought, I bought $3 million worth of drugs at one time. And those drugs you made in South Central Los Angeles? No, no, I didn't make them in South Central. Well, I, bought them, I bought them there, but I didn't make them. I never, I never actually made cocaine. I, I used to turn it into crack. Uh, but turning the crack, any, anybody could do it once they know the formula. So where did they come from originally? Oh, they come from Colombia. So, so now talk about this. We, we, we talk about Nixon and the war on drugs and being tough, and then we take it all the way up to Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, being tough on crime, saying no to drugs, but at the same time, them having more love for the people in Nicaragua and the Contras to fight the Sandinistas and some of the people in their own country that they were supposed to protect. Talk about how that... Well, I, I didn't know about that until I went to court. All right, speak on it now. Well, eventually, eventually I got arrested. Uh, my partner, the one that I paid the $60,000 to me, well, he turned, out, he, he turned into an informant. Well, he always kind of been working with the government, but this time he was working to put all the people in, that, in prison that he had been working with, you know, really got made who we were, who we became. Well, he, he set me up with DEA. So DEA arrested me, I'm sitting in prison, uh, looking at a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Um, and we don't know how we're gonna fight the case. We're looking for ways to fight this case. Well, one day my lawyer, I called my lawyer and he says that he got a call from this reporter from uh, the San Jose Mercury News. And this reporter wanted to help us with the case, that he knew my informant, because I really didn't know who this guy was, really. I knew, I knew his name, I've been over his house a couple times, but I didn't really know who this guy was. I don't know nothing about Contras, uh, 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 the Sandinistas, or Nick. I didn't even know about Nicaragua. As far as that, far as that went, uh, I was just a street drug dealer. Well, my lawyer said that this guy wanted to talk to me, and. I felt I didn't have nothing to lose. I'm like, they already said they're gonna give me a life sentence. What I got to lose? Tell the reporter to come down and talk to me. So this reporter, he came down, he talked to me, and he told me that this guy had a lot of luggage and uh, they couldn't put this guy on the witness stand. It was no way that they was gonna put this guy on the witness stand because he was gonna expose stuff that the government didn't want out. So I don't know, I mean, I had already dealt with some corrupt cops who was planting drugs and stealing money and, 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 and stuff like that. So I said, well, maybe it's more of that. So we go to trial. So the guy is testifying. They put, the, they put this guy on the witness stand, just like he said they wouldn't do. So the reporter, he's there with us, and he's helping my lawyer defend me. Well, while the guy's testifying, he's talking about his boss went on a fishing trip with George Bush. Yeah, yeah, our president George Bush, senior, not the, not the young one, but the one that's sick right now, the daddy. So he talked about his guy went on a fishing trip with George W. Bush. I'm saying me, little Ricky Ross, illiterate from South Central, is connected to somebody that went on a fishing trip with George Bush? Then he said that when a guy came back off the fishing trip, 
he told them in a meeting that they had in Honduras that the ends justified the means, meaning that it was okay for them to sell drugs to win this war that the United States Congress had told Ronald Reagan and George Bush not to give any more money to these people because they were doing crimes against innocent people. So, so let me ask you this. Do you think that the government knew that the drugs would be put into the black community and what devastation it would have? Well, you know what? Um, let's say this here. I don't know if they knew that they knew it was going to the black community. Yeah, they had to. True. <laughs> they had to. Okay, so, 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 and this gets into the real part because why we're here. Because we, we, we talk about it and I look at you and I get so much hope from you because for a person to have been uh, turned on by the system that you supposedly lived in where they give people like Oliver North a pardon, where they give Benito Blandon 28 months but give you life in jail now only because of your ability to be resilient and to be smart and studious to go in and overturn the cases to get yourself out. But now you're coming out to work in this system. So how do we effectively work in the system that we know doesn't effectively work for us or have our best interests at heart? Well, what well, well, we got to do as, as a people, what, what, what I did to myself is, is I started to educate myself. You know, like I said, I went in, I was 28 years old, I was totally illiterate. The first thing I had to do, I taught myself how to read and write. So, so let me ask you this, and I want to stop because this is so important. How is it that you were able to teach yourself how to read and write with the help of some of your inmate friends, but yet the school that had you for 12 years couldn't accomplish that same goal? Well, they didn't have the same interest in me reading as my cellmate did. My cellmate knew that if I didn't learn how to read, that I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. I, I think that's worth repeating. Say that again. My cellmate knew that if I didn't teach myself how to read or write, that I was going to be spending the rest of my life in prison. And he didn't want me in prison for the rest of my life. He felt that I should be on the street. So, so what I get from that, you say it is essential that the people who work with somebody absolutely love and care about them. The oh, they got way. to. They got to. Otherwise, they, they, they can't teach them nothing. If, I mean, we can feel when somebody got love for us. Yes. And, and kids know when you really got their best interests at heart. That's why that I can go anywhere in this country and, and feel totally safe. You know, people tell me all the time, man, you come over here without bodyguards? Because when they find out who I am, they got love for me because they know I got love for them. And I feel that it's essential for us to have love for our children. Um, if you got love for them, you can teach them how to be a drug dealer, even if they don't want to be a drug dealer. So if you got love for them, they're going to allow you to teach them almost anything that you want to teach them because they know you're doing it out of love. So, so as you go on to this, and now we, we're talking about a lot of the things that you are doing, can you give the audience uh, some, some instances of, the, of some of the success that you've had with some of the schools, some of the prisons that you visited, some of the things that you said that's helped to turn around those systems in some way? Yeah, I spoke in, in high schools, uh, junior. I, I don't like really speaking under junior high school because they, they're kind of too young. <laughs> uh, uh, but junior high school is, is really right. 13 years old, you know, they ready. They ready. They finna make some moves in, in a minute. But I've been uh, Chicago. Uh, I spoke at about 12 houses, I mean, 12 high schools in Chicago when, when, when I first got out. And, and that's how, you know, I told the nation yesterday how I got to Minister Farrakhan's house. Um, I spoke at Brown University, you know, which is one of the most prominent colleges in this country, and they paid me too. <laughs> but, I spoke but, but, but it's something interesting that you said. Now, an Ivy League school paid you, but how many calls have you got from the HBCU? I haven't. I, I tried to volunteer to go to Morehouse, uh, Howard. Uh, they, I, and I understand though. I understand I why, mean, why, why they won't let me go there. Uh, Help me understand, because I don't understand. Well, say for instance at Stanford. I spoke at Stanford. I spoke in a classroom where they only allow 35 of the smartest kids in the school to take. After you finish college, 35 kids get picked to go in this class. The people who started Google went to this class. Yahoo went, the guys who started Yahoo went to this classroom. And I got to speak to them, and I had lunch with them, and it was just, just a total experience. Uh, well, these deans are not afraid of losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. 
for controversy. Ooh, say that again. Mm. Say that again, because it's so important that for the people who, who look like us, who do care, but the need to be fearless. Speak on that. Well, if, if, if you're doing a job and you're not superior at your job, then you stand a chance of losing it. But if you Michael Jordan, you ain't worried about losing your job because he know every team in the league is going to take him on if he loses the job at whatever team it is. Well, a lot of times with us as people, we're not doing our job at a high level. We just barely hanging on. We barely do enough to, to make it or to get by. And I believe that that's what's happening with our kids at our schools because our kids are barely making it. So if they barely making it, that means that they teachers barely make it. If the teachers strive, then the, te the students are gonna strive. Um, I got two new babies since I've been home. My son. <laughs> Tell them the ages of the This man 57. Tell them the ages of your baby. 57 years old. I've been a vegan for 30 years. I haven't eaten meat, eggs, butter, sugar, none of the stuff that kill us. <laughs> How old is your baby? So let them know that you're strong. <laughs> I got a four year old, been reading for two years. My son is six years old. They wanted to put him, he's smart enough to be in the second grade, but he in the first grade because they say he's too little to, to be in the second grade because the kids are teasing. Uh, he can read, spell, anything that you put in front of him. They play tennis like. <laughs> and, and all of that's because we've been instilling the love that it needs for them to nourish and to develop into the kids that we want them to be. And anything that we want them to be, they're going to be it because they're going to give us back what we ask them for. So if we give our kids... I believe that the drug dealers gave me more love than my teachers did. So we can't sit around and let drug dealers outdo us, because that's what's been happening. We've been letting gang members outdo us. That's why our kids are gang banging. We've been letting Little Wayne outdo us. These guys getting on the records, I don't know if y'all listen to the music, but every now and then one of my grandkids will get in the car and turn that music on, and they talking about popping mollies, and I look at him, I say, boy, you pop mollies too? And he say, no, Grandpa, I don't do that, but that's just a song. I say, yeah, but you know, that's how I got turned out. And then if we don't talk to them and let them know what happened, then they not going to know. They going to believe what Little Wayne is saying. They going to think that the guy who say, he, he dumb, stupid, who really got a college degree, by the way. Two chains. <laughs> They're going to believe that these guys are cool and what they saying happened is supposed to happen just the way they said it was. Uh, I also spoke at USC Law School. I spoke at UCLA Law School. Um, I spoke at a law class at St. Francis, Illinois. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, I spoke in an auditorium with about 800 uh, students. Um, I spoke at the police academy in LA. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I've been in jails. Uh, it, it's still kind of hard, which is my best audience. I mean, they, they really should have me on a, on a jailhouse tour because I could show the guys in jail what I did. Oh yeah, I didn't tell y'all too, I read over 300 books before I got out of prison. Clap for that. So, so I, I, I want to go back to the point that you made. We're talking about going to different places, all of these prestigious places, but other places weren't. Now, you had talked about Gary Webb, the, the reporter who had kind of brought all of this to light. Uh, tell us what happened to Gary Webb. Well, I don't know if you know, but Gary Webb, after he wrote this article, it, it went crazy. Um, it was the first time any major newspaper had ever published an article on the Internet. Uh, lucky, lucky for the internet because they was going to pull that thing. <laughs> but after they had put it out, they didn't know enough about that internet. They didn't know you can't pull it back once you done pulled it out. So it hit the, it hit the newspaper and it just went viral. Uh, they said it was the first time that uh, the black community had went on the internet in, in droves the way they did. He said uh, it was getting a million hits per day. Wow. Maxine Waters picked it up. Jesse Jackson uh, picked it up. Um, and it just went crazy. 
Well, after it went out for a while, the CIA got involved. Then the LA Times went against Gary Webb, the New York Times, Huffington Post. The first time all the major newspapers had attacked another newspaper. Well, eventually what they did is they took Gary off the story because Gary was trying to find what they say, the smoking gun, because they didn't have a smoking gun. You know, they say he didn't have a smoking gun. He had a lot of allegations, but no smoking gun. So they pulled Gary off the story, told him he couldn't work on the story no more, uh, put him out somewhere where they say he was uh, uh, doing stories on horse poop or something like that. Uh, so after that, he eventually uh, lost his job. Um, a few months later, um, I was doing an a interview with somebody, and they asked me had I heard, and uh, they said Gary Webb had killed himself, had shot himself in the head twice. Uh, <laughs> He committed suicide, but he shot himself in the head. How many times? Twice. Twice. So, so the point, what I wanted to make with Gary Webb, though, was this. If Gary Webb, who was not a member of our community, but saw an atrocity and was willing to put his life on the line, and we have some people who you said are afraid to lose their what? Their job. Their jobs. So what's the message you have for those people who are in the audience today who might not be at the top of the food chain, but they see something going on that's not right, and they have to say, what, what advice do you have for them? Well, you, you, have, to, you have to make changes. If you, if, if, if you don't stand up to making change, then you just as bad as the person that's doing it. If, if you see somebody committing a crime and you're standing right there, you could be held accountable to that crime. Uh, um, I think Professor Armour at, 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 at USC said it's, oh, the word was right there at the top of my party to the crime. He, he called it something else, though, in my documentary. He, he called it, uh, uh, what's that word? Ah, uh, wow. Well, we know what you're it, it, it eludes me right now. But it, it, it's up to us to, to, to stand up for right to do what we know is right, even if it's going to cost you your job. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to do at the level you're supposed to be at, nobody's going to be able to fire you. And if they do, you're going to be able to get another job. So as we start to talk about all of these things going inside of here, this fearlessness that everybody has to have, we need you and everybody else like you. Um, there's a movie called Catch Me If You Can by a man named Frank Abernell. You ever heard of him? I heard of it. He was a, a big con artist, white man. He went to jail for a few years, but afterwards the FBI used him to be an FBI teacher, to teach them how to catch other people who counterfeit. I want to know how many times have any of our government agencies contacted you or any of our brothers in prisons that have knowledge like you to be able to help them if this war on drugs is really serious? Well, they haven't, they haven't contacted me. I have to wrestle to go into the prisons. I mean, for me, uh, juvenile halls are, is pretty easy, but going to a men's prison is, 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 is hard. And I believe the couple men prisons that I went into, the wardens called my managers back and told them, say, man, guys in prison is reading. They reading books. Because what they want to know, see, they see my success. And, and I don't know if y'all know about some of the successes that, that I've had, uh, but I want to say one more thing before, before I go into that. After Gary Webb was dead, I don't know if y'all know, but the CIA did their own investigation. Guess what they said? What they say? Yes, our guys were selling drugs. We did know that they were selling drugs, but we didn't sanction it. They didn't sanction it, but they knew. They knew, so, so, but as a government agent, see, at one time, it was by law they were supposed to tell on them or arrest them. But what they did is they went to the attorney general and had the attorney general to do some type of exempt, where this time, you don't have to tell. That one time. That one time. So when, when I saw that, I said, that's the smoking gun. Gary Webb was right, and I don't know if you know, but a lot of the newspapers did do like some one-liner, uh, daily time, uh, one-line apology to Gary Webb. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw, he had a movie came out called Kill a Messenger, but they did do some one-liners where they did apologize to him. Uh, I don't know if that was enough, uh, but basically what they said is nobody did anything anyway. So. I got a few more questions, but I want the audience to get ready because this is a conversation that's supposed to involve all of us. So we're going to give you a chance to ask uh, Brother Ross some questions. 
But, but one of the biggest things that, that people always say is, well, how can you have Ricky Ross on here freeway because he did all of this great damage to our community? Let, let the people understand when you got into the dope day game, how you were trying to bring Hollywood to the hood, how you were really trying to do something what you thought was something pleasurable and good rather than the destruction that it caused. Well, when, when, when I was growing up, I grew up at, a, at, a, at an interesting time. Um, it was still, still during a time where there was a lot of racism going on. I can remember... Oh, did uh, it stop? stop? Oh. <laughs> well, back then it was real bad. They was blunt with it. Let's say that there. They were more blunt with it back then. More over. One time I had got hurt when I was in Texas on the farm. Uh, I got hit in the back of the head with a, with, with, a, with a tree branch. My mom took me to the doctor. When we went into the doctor's office, they had a sign on the TV, but I couldn't read. I just went up to the TV and hit the button. The sign said, whites only. When I turned the TV on, the nurse came out and scolded me about turning on the TV. And then, at first they wasn't urging us in the back, but after I did that, they urged us straight to the back. We went to the back to a section, the black section, where it was cigarette butts, the walls was dirty, uh, filthy. So that was my first taste of racism of things that whites could have that blacks couldn't have. And it was a few more incidents that, that I went through. Uh, restaurants where you had to go to the back of the restaurant and get your food, you couldn't go to the front. So when I was coming up, and even when I played tennis, it wasn't so blunt, but I was saying things that we couldn't have. Like we played in the LA City Championship for tennis to see who was the best tennis, the high school tennis team in, 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 in the city. Well, we couldn't go through the front of the LA tennis club. We went through a side door through the kitchen. So when I started selling drugs, I felt that cocaine was another one of those things that Hollywood was benefiting from that had, that they didn't want us to have. And I thought that me bringing cocaine to South Central LA, making it affordable for, for my people, was like going through the side door or going through the front door. Like my, my last year in high school, where well, we went through the front door. We didn't go through the side door no more. We walked straight through the front of the club and everybody in there had to look and say, what are they doing? So when I brought cocaine to my hood, that's what I thought I was doing, bringing a piece of Hollywood to South Central LA. We got, we, got, we got a lot of people who want to ask you some questions, so we're going to open it up uh, to the public. State your name. <laughs> How you doing? My name is LaShawn Jackson. Um, thank you all for having this. I, you know, I, didn't know, I didn't know you was going to be here until after we talked about this, but I just want to say this. I, um, I have a charter school in Chicago, and you say you've been to Chicago a lot, so y'all know what's going on in Chicago. I'm from the South Side, and I have a lot of people like yourself that come from the prisons and talk to the youth about the life, you know, the street life. And I think it's very important that you have these young kids here because they really need to hear from somebody that they can listen to. Because a lot of us, well, they might see me as the director of the school as not having an understanding of that, but you've been through it. So please continue what you're doing. And I also want to talk to you, if I, if I can, when you finish to talk about something in Chicago. Um, my question is this. You said that the games gave you more love than the teachers, right? And I have a, a high school also, so I deal with at-risk youth, and I see a lot of them struggling to come to school. Um, what part do you feel that the family, the black family has outside of the school? I understand the teaching aspect of it, but just the family, because you said when your family kind of broke apart, that's kind of where a little bit of you fell apart. What do you feel the black family, the role the black family plays in building our communities back up? Well, what a black, black family has to play a big part in uh, the development of the child. Uh, with, with, with me, my mom was working. She was a single parent. So a lot of times when she was away, we was in the streets, you know, hanging out with the older guys, learning the, the tricks of the trade. You know, we just lucky that uh, None of my immediate family, my brothers and my sisters, none of us 
got killed in the games because, like I said earlier, tennis took me away from the streets where they didn't take them away from the streets. They gangbang. Uh, my sister had been arrested for, for shooting in somebody's house at another girl. So had my mom been around to see, she wouldn't have allowed us to do that because my mom was strict. When she found out I was selling drugs, she put me out the house. Um, so I believe that the black family definitely plays a major role and they have to have that love too. And they also have to be taught what it is that they need to be doing. Brother Shia. Double duty, sorry. I'm, I'm Brother C.R. Winston. Um, the question I had um, stems from something that we actually had here, not as great as your situation, but a couple years ago, the DEA ran a drug operation here in our city. And I'm, I had asked, I know the mayor was here earlier, I had asked him a while ago when Maxine Waters came to town um, about had any CIA agents been um, prosecuted or held account for them running the operation in the city, and she had acknowledged they hadn't. But we had an operation here. My question stems with the fact that you have government agents running operations, but well, what they do is they're successful in running drug operations because they prevent the normal things that would stop drugs in the community, to the police and certain people that want to stop it, that they move those things out the way that the, our Milwaukee Journal Sentinel had identified that the DA basically made hands off to their operation. But what you mentioned is so um, key because they also talked about that um, those DA agents had young people so enthralled with them, they were getting tattoos of their code names on their bodies. So my question is, can you talk more about how this situation is something that they have planned and how they, op how they actually, you are an agent for them without even knowing and moving obstacles out of your way to be successful? Well, I, I don't know much about how the government's operation ran. I only know uh, what Danilo Blandon testified to in the courtroom and what the CIA's uh, 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 report says. Um, so my knowledge of the CIA is, is really limited to their operations and, 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 and how they operate. Uh, I think where I really came in on the whole investigation is our live Gary Webb to tie the CIA into the black community. Um, my name is Chastity and Stand up. Stand up. Uh -huh. yeah. um, my question is looking back when you were younger, if you had both of your parents in your life, would you think it would be different? Well, um, we know that with, with, with two parents, uh, definitely makes a difference. Say, for instance, with, I had two friends that I grew up with, uh, uh, both had their father and mother at the house. Both did everything I did, maybe not to the same level as I did it, uh, but they did get started. Uh, neither one went to prison. Uh, and I don't know if that's by coincidence or if having a father in the house allowed them a, a, a different uh, uh, type of background. But just about all of my friends who didn't have a father, all of us went to prison. But these two guys didn't go to prison, so I do accredit them having a father. You know, the, their fathers would take us on motorcycle rides. Uh, uh, they did things with us that none of the rest of us who didn't have a father was able to do. But just having somebody with that strong firmness around, uh, um, it gives a kid confidence, if nothing else. You know, uh, uh, I can remember before I went to prison, I had a couple young boys and, and, and they played tennis and I could tell when they went to the tennis tournament how much more confident they was when I was there than they was when I wasn't there. So even for nothing else, just for the confidence and the, and the strength. We're gonna have to uh, end this conversation real quick uh, right here, but I want you to know that uh, Mr. Ross does have his autobiography. He is willing uh, to uh, take pictures and to sign those and ask more questions before we turn it over to Jermaine. Mr. Ross, I just want you to give the people, people always say, if there's only one thing you remember from this, a quick one minute or less statement, what would you Wait, say? so I can't ask a question? I, I, I can't ask a question? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! <laughs> Miss 
Mr. Rapp, my question is, some folks are suspect in terms of your mission and your focus. Why should the African American community forgive you for your role in the distribution of crack cocaine in our community? Well, nobody never asked me that before. Why so, should the black community? Well, the first thing that they have to do is they have to look at my work. You know, uh, they shouldn't just, which we do so often as a black people, we just give away our stuff to, to people who don't care nothing about us. You know, we buy their product, we support them. Uh, but what, what the black community should do with me is they should investigate. They should do their research and figure out if I deserve to be forgiven. Right. Don't just forgive me because I ask you to forgive me. Investigate me and see if I'm worthy of forgiveness. And if I'm not, then don't. But if you find out that I am, then you should. And that's the way I would answer that question. Gotcha. We got one minute. No, so I, I think you almost answered it, but if there's one thing that you want the audience to remember from this, all of this conversation, to go out as they go and prepare to help our children, what do you want them to remember? Well, I think one of the most important things is if you look at my, my background, where I come from, my testimony is a story of somebody who was illiterate, was dumb, who thought he was dumb, who had been tricked into believing that he was dumb, who went from there to being smarter than lawyers who had graduated from Harvard, Yale. I don't know where my judge went to college at, <laughs> but she was a chief judge in San Diego. A person who went from that into being a person that went into the courtroom and started dictating to the scholars what should and should not happen inside of a courtroom. Um, I can remember when the judge gave me my life sentence and she hit the little, the little hammer on the table and that was urging me out. And the last thing I told her when I walked out the courtroom is, I'll be back. And she told me, I'll be here when you get back. <laughs> when I came back, she told me, she said, you kept your word. <laughs> the last thing I want to tell you all is that I read over 300 books. And inside of reading those 300 books, I found three books that really, really helped me analyze my life. And I would recommend, they really should be teaching these books in school. Those books are Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, As a Man Think by James Allen, or As a Woman Think by James Allen, uh, and The Richest Man in Babylon. Those three books really helped me build my new foundation that I have right now. Uh, and I've been having some successes. Last year I was nominated for an Emmy Award for my documentary that I produced, uh, co-directed. Next year y'all will be seeing my movie that I'll be producing and co-directing. Um, I mean, I had some phenomenal victories. I mean, uh, having dinner at Minister Farrakhan's house, meeting with Don King, and these are some of the things that I wanted to do when I was in prison. So thank y'all for your time. Uh, it was an honor being here. And thank thanks a lot, man. Mr. Ross. Thanks a lot, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Roby. Now listen, we have a tight schedule. For those who like to stand and give a round of applause,